Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today's lecture is called The Great Pretender, and I'll be talking at length about how traumatic stress can show up as the great pretender in our profession. What I mean by this will become more clear as you listen on, but basically, if you are in vet med or have been in vet med for a while, you probably know there are certain disease processes that we sometimes call the great pretenders. And if you know extra ones that I don't count, I'm just going to give you a couple examples uh, and you know more than I do, please feel free to comment below. Um, but one example are mast cell tumors, for instance. They can show up on the skin of dogs as like rashes or a tiny little bump or just skin stuff that you would never in a million years think might actually be a pretty bad cancer. And they can be very conniving and even difficult to diagnose. Uh, so they, we call them the great pretenders. And then there's also Addison's disease. Addison's is also a human disease, but it's basically hypoadrenocorticism. And it can be very conniving and sleuth-like as well, because it can show up as just like generally not doing well, just lethargy or vomiting diarrhea, and until you do the appropriate testing, you actually sometimes may treat it as something else. And really, it's because they don't have enough cortisol in their body and other types of important salts that the body needs. I'm not going to get into all the physiology of Addison's disease right now because that's not what this lecture is about. But basically, this lecture is about understanding your own neuro neurobiology before it's too late. So let's just jump right in. The research is important to just note that I have extrapolated a lot from this book called The Body Keeps the Score by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Obviously, his is more in relation to humans. It is not a veterinary medicine book. And currently, there is no veterinary medicine book on traumatic stress. I think, as far as I know, I'm the primary person speaking the most on this topic, and I have been for the past eight years or so at conferences and other events, CE events, etc. And But if you haven't read this book and you just want to dive deeper, I highly recommend it will change your life. And then there's also my certification in traumatic stress that I did through the International Academy of Traumatology. And then I've also extrapolated some secrets from the Veterinary Confessionals Project, which I founded back when I was in vet school. And I still run to this day. Instagram is the best platform for it. So if you haven't heard of it or you're interested, go check out the website. And then I'll also link below uh, the links to it. All right, so moving on. I just want you to know, though, predominantly all the research comes from human medicine, and there's just not a lot of research currently in vet med. I think maybe Merck was the first group to actually fund a research study on mental health and well being in veterinary medicine, and there is a slow progression of growth of more interested parties. I think now there's even um, veterinary social care workers as well coming up. But as you know, research takes a long time to go through the whole process and then get published and then make it make sense in the real world. So hopefully this video helps you in the interim. Because traumatic stress runs rampant through our profession. And if we aren't actively practicing with awareness of this, how can we solve this problem? Like, it's absolutely mind-boggling to think that, like, you can solve something without truly understanding what the cause of it is, at least scientifically speaking, 
we typically need to understand the pathophysiology and etiology of a disease process in order to truly understand how to nip it at the bud or how to properly attack it. Otherwise, a lot of times it's just kind of like we're just putting Band-Aid solutions on. We're just kind of calming down the fire or calming down symptoms. And we do tend to largely focus on symptoms like compassion fatigue and burnout and even suicide, which apparently now we're number one. Like veterinarians and veterinary professionals have already passed police officers and dentists, I thought we were number three at one point in terms of wanting to unalive ourselves, but now apparently we're number one. So even more, and I don't know if COVID had something to do with that, that exacerbated the situation. Because as you know, if you've been working through COVID, I worked all through COVID in the ER. Uh, it was a... It was interesting. We'll just say that. And it's just important to understand that like these can be symptoms of traumatic stress and it could actually be end stage of traumatic stress. So if you could be better informed about what's going on in your brain and body, I think you would have better coping techniques and hopefully even if you don't stay in the profession, create some sort of better well-being for yourself. That's really ultimately my goal, is to help educate, help you understand what I've come to understand, which has helped me immensely in my profession, not even in my professional life, but also my personal life as well. And just briefly touching on our learning objectives. So this will be a longer form lecture because we have a lot of learning objectives and they'll be to, I will list all the learning objectives below. I'm just kind of quickly going through this slide. Basically, we'll talk about the difference of primary and secondary traumatic stress and how it manifests in our profession. We'll talk about different theories of how it relates to compassion fatigue. We'll talk about triggers and how it affects our nervous system. And towards the end, we'll make a plan to utilize resources, make plans for resiliency and for prevention of self, for self, hopefully to try and minimize some of the effects of just the nature of being in our job, being in our profession. Sometimes it really, especially if you work emergency or urgent care, or even if you're in general practice, but you do deal with like seeing a lot of sick patients, um, but even surgery can sometimes feel like, wow, this can feel like a lot uh, and can almost feel like going into battle. But I don't want to, you know, say that like it's like we're going to war every day. But the struggle is real and it's not what everyone thinks it is. It's not all like happy and playing with puppies and kittens, although we do have those days, too or those appointments, should I say. But um, I primarily work in emergency. So when a cute puppy or a kitten comes in, I'm like, you better be having diarrhea or just vomiting or something and not have parvo and not have like some horrible disease because otherwise I'll be very sad because we don't get to see them unless there's something really bad, usually. But every now and then we get the one that just had the hiccups and the owner was concerned and that's always very refreshing or the occasional pot puppy. It's like, oh, accidentally ate a little bit of marijuana and now he's just a little stony baloney. So those are nice, <laughs> nice comic relief. And that's why we also will, throughout my lectures and my videos, always try and have a little bit of fun and try and not take ourselves too seriously. I personally can be pretty serious at times, but I love good comedy and, you know, having fun, especially working with animals. I mean, that's kind of like the best part sometimes is they are way more fun than humans, should I say. And I do have to include trigger warnings as well, just in case you already know you have like PTSD or complex PTSD or any other sort of mental health situation that would make it difficult for you to listen to some of this stuff. 
And at any point, if you do feel overwhelmed, please just walk away, take a break, take some space for yourself. There's no need to, you know, force it or feel overwhelmed and triggered. But it is important to recognize that there are positive and negative triggers and triggers often indicate an issue or an unresolved wound or some sort of information that may be important for your well-being. That being said, there are, sorry, I'm just like really nasally today for some reason, a little bit congested. I apologize if it's annoying, but I'll try and keep my sniffling to a minimum. But that being said, there are support resources as well that are completely free. I've listed them all here. And if you just feel so overwhelmed where you can't even think about contacting a crisis center, just remember to take deep breaths. and maybe open up a meditation app or try practice a deep breathing like the calm app or insight timer those are also very useful which i haven't included here you can also do the crisis text line there's lots of different options but remember this is a vet confessional secret that i just wanted to put here because i think it's really important to know that if you feel down get help I also think we're just really not the best about when you're in the helping profession, you're so used to helping others that you can be not so great at asking for help yourself. So you know how in the business we talk about people that bring their pet in for coughing for eight months, don't be depressed and wait for it to go away. Your absence will devastate someone. Don't let it get to that point. Seek help professional help and find joy in something else, please. This was from one of the conferences. I really like this confession because I think it's really true how many times, especially in emergency, oh my gosh, I can't even count the amount of times people come in on finally on a, I don't know, Friday night, all of a sudden their dog that's been coughing for eight months or getting worse or not eating for five weeks suddenly they're here and it's like they're on death's door. So we'll always be like, oh yeah, just happened overnight, huh? Like <laughs> just came up overnight. All of a sudden now it's an emergency, you know, when this could have been addressed way, way, way sooner. Don't let it get to that point. Sure. On the more compassionate side, life happens, things happen, money troubles happen. It's difficult. People have kids, people have other responsibilities. It's difficult to get to the vet sometimes. But, or even for ourselves, it's difficult to make that appointment with your doctor. It's difficult to make that appointment with your mental health professional or even find a mental health professional. But please, at least find joy in something else. So I am going to go into the definitions of trauma, and this part's going to be a little bit boring. I apologize, but I just want you to think before we get into it, what does psychological trauma mean to you? Like if someone asked you how you would classify it, I'm just going to take a break to take a sip of tea and let you think about that for a second. Just because I think that... Honestly, until I started studying this stuff, I don't even think I could describe it or define it, but I'm going to give you the DSM definitions here, uh, the fifth edition. So it's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders. So we're going to start with primary stress injuries and the definitions around that. Primary stress injuries are pretty common. It's caused by acute stress and it's the most common form of stress. So short-term acute stress doesn't have enough time to do extensive damage associated with long-term stress. And you know, some stress is good because it helps you build resilience. If you never got stressed, you know, you wouldn't actually build those muscles that help you deal with stress. So there are even places that will 
basically do s stress trials or like do uh, program stress to help you train to be more accustomed to dealing with stress. But let's just stick to the definitions. Primary acute stress can show up as either emotional distress, which the three stress emotions are anger, anxiety, and depression. It can also show up as muscular problems. So you might get a headache, you might get back pain, you ain't get jaw pain, tendon, ligament problems, or stomach, gut, and bowel problems. You could get heartburn acid, like too much stomach acid, diarrhea, constipation, irritable bowel, etc. So when does it progress to acute stress disorder? Acute stress disorder, ASD, is the initial psychological reaction to witnessing or experiencing psychological trauma. Don't worry, I will get into like the actual definition of psychological trauma, but just know that ASD precedes PTSD, um, and the DSM characterizes ASD by the fulfillment of certain criteria. So, A, having experienced intense fear, helplessness, or horror in response to a traumatic experience, and I'll explain what constitutes a traumatic experience because it's a long-ass definition, guys, and it's I is there, need a whole nother slide for that. And then B, displaying three or more of the following disassociative symptoms. These could be emotional numbing, detachment or absence of emotional responsiveness, <clears throat> reduction in awareness of surroundings. That's like getting the blinders on, not understanding like what's happening around you because you just have like tunnel vision. Um, derealization or depersonalization and disassociative amnesia. I will get into all of these kind of like how the brain, how this shows up with specific examples as I go throughout this lecture. I'm just keeping it concise for definition purposes right now. And then C, the last part of the criteria for acute stress disorder would be exhibiting at least one symptom from each of the following groups. One, re-experiencing, such as recurring thoughts, memories, dreams, or flashbacks. Um, two, avoidance of trauma-related stimuli, deliberately avoiding reminders of the trauma. Three, anxiety or increased arousal. So increased autonomic nervous system activity. And then finally, they say that significant distress or functional impairment that persists for a minimum of two days to a maximum of four weeks is basically classified as ASD. And then if the duration of the disorder exceeds four weeks, that's when they diagnose PTSD. So the best way to remember this is just, it's just a timeline thing. And with PTSD, you can also have all this criteria as well. It's just, if your symptoms are lasting more than four weeks, then it can become post-traumatic stress disorder instead of just acute stress disorder. And this is important to know because sometimes when something really traumatic happens, if you pay attention to the timeline, it can help you decide, not that I'm saying you should be going around self-diagnosing, this definitely has to be diagnosed by a mental health professional, but it can help you decide, okay, like, when is the time, like, do I need to get help? And like, these are the things you can watch for, like the recurring thoughts, or the intrusive thoughts, or like memories or dreams. Like, I don't know how many times I've talked about stress dreams, and I probably need to do a separate video on that. But like, almost all veterinary professionals I know, we've talked about like having different kinds of stress streams, like based on what's going on with our patients or like getting home and waking up in the middle of the night being like, oh my gosh, I just had a dream that this and this surgery went terribly or something. And that could have been something that happened that you're re-experiencing. So, et cetera. This is all very important to pay attention to. 
So here is the definition of psychological trauma as promised. It is a mouthful, that's for sure, but I am going to read it and then I'm going to talk about why there's criticism around these requirements in the mental health field. But the DSM had to settle on something and apparently this is what they settled on. So an individual must first experience a traumatic episode defined as a direct personal experience of an event that involves actual or threatened death or serious injury or other threat to one's physical integrity or witnessing an event that involves involves death, injury, or a threat to the physical integrity of another person or learning about an unexpected or violent death serious harm or threat of death or injury experienced by a family member or other close associate. You're like, huh? What? Yeah, that's what I thought. Even when I still read this now and I've read it a million times, I'm just like, oh God, this definition is not great, but it makes sense. And then I'll get into more why it does make sense. The second prerequisite would be required that the survivor must have experienced intense fear, helplessness, or horror following the event. So if you're just like, man, that wasn't a big deal. I'm fine. I mean, maybe you are truly fine then, and you didn't experience the intense fear, helplessness, or horror following the event, then great. Then maybe you won't be as, maybe you have more resilience. Um, And I just want to point out the word helplessness here as well, because when you're in a helping profession, the feeling of helplessness happens often. And you may not even be realizing, like, how many times have you had an owner come in with an extremely sick animal and they decide not to do anything and go home? And your job is to help animals. The intensity of helplessness feelings can be extremely traumatic without you even realizing. And sometimes those are the most heartbreaking cases because you don't know what happened to that animal. I mean, at least if they allowed you to do some sort of treatment or the animal was so sick they were euthanized. Um, Let's say it was something that was like, you either have to go to surgery or like they're gonna die a horrible death. At least the euthanasia helps with like feeling like you ended the suffering and you help them. But when it's ultimately the owner's decision and the AMA form is signed against medical advice and they leave or other situations where a lot of helplessness feelings come up often. So that's why I really wanted to emphasize that part in the definition, but I will come back to that more as well. And then, like I said, clinicians and researchers have criticized both the requirements. And I'll explain why, because there is a trauma dilemma. So there is a debate over what constitutes a traumatic event. And this emerged with the first inclusion of the diagnosis in the DSM-3 and has persisted. You guys, I cannot believe that like trauma and traumatic stress has not, like didn't even exist as a diagnosis till the 80s, till the 80s. And Bessel van der Kolk talks about this in his book where he talks about like people had to petition, like people were coming back from war with all sorts of issues like flashbacks, addictions, alcoholism, like ruined lives because they didn't know what was going on with their nervous system and their body. And once they figured out what was going on, thankfully to all these medical professionals who were doing research and trying to help these war veterans, it had to be petitioned in order to be recognized in an actual, as an actual mental health problem. That just blows my mind because like, the 80s was not that long ago. I mean, it seems like it it was so long ago, but it's not. Um, just almost really like 40 years. That's nothing, nothing. 
So some researchers have argued that the broad definition of trauma has led, unfortunately, though, to the overdiagnosis of PTSD resulting from less threatening events. And some say that, you know, they really think trauma, there should be a narrower definition of trauma just because it's been detrimental in client care and in forensic and disability settings to um, have this kind of really broad generalization. Others disagreed, suggesting that what might be traumatic for one individual may not be for another, and that an attempt to include all possible traumatic events within the context of a diagnosis was futile. I don't know where I stand on this. Honestly, I kind of agree, kind of disagree. I'm someone who always ends up being like Switzerland in the end. Like, even when I'm having conversations with people, I'm just like, well, I fall somewhere in the middle. Um, not always, but I try and see as many different perspectives as I can, and I try and find balance in all aspects of my life as much as possible. There are certainly some situations where I feel very strongly and opinionated about, don't get me wrong, but when it comes to this trauma dilemma, I'm just going to say that if you feel traumatized, you probably are. But I do also dislike how a lot of people are like, oh, my God, that was so much. Tra that was so traumatic. I can't believe like they said this, this and this. Now I'm traumatized. And it's like, OK, like, let's not just like water down the word trauma because it is now overly used and everyone's traumatized. <laughs> but then again, I'm like, yeah, everyone is kind of traumatized from different events that have happened in their lives. So who are we to say that they are or they aren't? But it's just annoying when people constantly use the word trauma when it's like, no, you were just upset. Like, or that just rubbed you the wrong way or like that bothered you. That wasn't necessarily like, oh, now all of a sudden you're traumatized. Anyway, I digress. Moving on. <laughs> so really quickly, just to reiterate traumatic stress and how primary trauma differs from secondary trauma. This is one of our first learning objectives. Now, that whole psychological trauma definition, that mouthful definition that I gave you kind of like lumps in primary trauma with secondary trauma. If you go back and read it, you'll understand what I'm saying. But to keep it simple, primary traumatic stress happens directly to you. And if you can't cope, you can develop post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And then secondary traumatic stress is observed by you, but it's happening to someone else, also known as vicarious trauma. And if you can't cope, you can develop secondary traumatic stress disorder, STSD, also known as compassion fatigue. And this is how my trauma journey started, why I started researching compassion fatigue that led me to realizing, oh, compassion fatigue is actually secondary traumatic stress disorder. Why is this happening? Why have we not been talking about this ever? Like, I mean, in vet school, they would come and talk to us about mental health and grief and like different things that we can do to try and like not unalive ourselves. But like, when you're in school too, when you're a vet student, you're just like so happy to be in school, like, cause it's so hard to get in that you're not even thinking about like the repercussions of like the real world. Cause you don't even know what the real world entails yet. So it kind of was also falling a little bit on deaf ears. And then the other problem with that was that, um, the people, the mental health professionals weren't actually veterinary professionals. So I would hear a lot of my classmates and people in my school talking about like, well, what do they know? They haven't ever experienced what we had to go through. And like, how do they know? You know, those kind of things will come up. And then that's just very dismissive because these people were genuinely trying to be helpful. Um, I always love the mental health stuff because I, I just love neurobiology and ecology. Uh, so I was always all about going to those lectures. Plus they were the easiest lectures in my mind because we never got tested on them. So there was no testing stress 
when I was in those lectures, I felt like I could truly relax and just soak in the information. And they were also very valuable. However, no one was actually really talking about trauma. And that's why I've been on this mission to constantly talk about it. Because I think the more you talk about it, the more awareness it's going to spread. That's my hope anyway. Moving on. So just to get into some specific examples. Oh. Okay. Primary trauma outside of veterinary medicine can be like traumatic accidents that you're involved in directly, um, death, I guess, that you or perceived like someone's trying to unalive you, essay, war, violence, even neglect. There is something called the ACE study, which they, in the mental health world, that is about determining if you have childhood neglect even, that you could have PTSD from that. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And then in vet med specifically, it's like, oh, being attacked or bitten by animals threatened by people or clients, anesthetic deaths or other procedure related deaths, professional mistakes, surgical errors or drug overdoses, like the list goes on, but these are just some examples. And I'll get into more specifics on that as well because I really want to make it make sense to y'all. Like instead of just generically talking about trauma, I really think using specific examples and analogies really helps people understand, at least for me. And I want to save you time from having to go in and dig up all this stuff by yourself because most people are, they, they ain't got time for that. That's just reality. So that's why we rely on YouTube and other places to give us the information that we are seeking in a clear and concise manner. And I do go off on tangents sometimes. I do apologize. I know it's probably annoying. I'll try and be better, but sometimes the tangents are fun. So this isn't even taking into consideration any result, unresolved childhood trauma. Like I'm not even talking about childhood trauma in any of my lectures because A, like I just can't even begin to dive into the world of childhood trauma, but just know that from going, I've been going to the trauma conferences every year since I got certified. I think I skipped last year though, because I was working or there was some vet conference I needed to go to, but pretty much for the past four years and during COVID, you know, it was online. But childhood trauma is very complex because it has a severe impact on the brain because it occurs when the brain is still developing. So trauma that occurs in, in childhood can be more severe than trauma that occurs in adulthood, which makes me sometimes feel like, oh, thank gosh, Maybe that is a positive sign for us who are in the veterinary profession talking about trauma. But it is also important to be working with a mental health professional or at least reading books and trying to educate yourself as much as you can to assess if maybe childhood trauma could also be a factor that impacts you today. Especially because trauma is compounded. So if left unresolved, new trauma adds to previous trauma in a negative way. But not to be all negative, there is also like they have found that chi children can also have very um, good resiliency in their brain already built in, whether genetically or through their environment. So I don't want to be a Debbie Downer. But important to know. This postcard is from Vet Confessionals, and I thought it was a good example of primary trauma in vet med. I don't know 100% for sure if this person was severely traumatized, but just kind of guessing here. And again, this is just my opinion. I am not trying to like diagnose anyone or anything like that. This is purely educational, but it says I was badly bitten, broke my hand, 
Now when a dog growls, I have a panic attack. So having a panic attack is an extreme response to a dog growling. I don't know if you've ever had a panic attack. Like if you haven't ever had a panic attack, you might not know this, but it is literally debilitating. And I don't know if they're using this term loosely and they just meant like they're having anxiety or not, but I'm just going off with the information that I have available. So yeah, getting bit by animals can be pretty freaking traumatic, can be. And yeah, like when a dog growls, it's scary. Don't get me wrong. I'm just like, oh, we're going to go get some chemical restraint or some physical restraint, or we're going to go grab a muzzle. But it typically shouldn't interfere with your ability to do your job. If it's getting to the point where you are basically devolving into a panic attack, um, that might mean you need a break or you need some help or switch to a different species, you know, until you have time to recover. But that's just one example. Some examples now moving on to secondary trauma or observed trauma, also known as mirroring, is Basically, they think that mirror neurons have something to do with secondary trauma, and this is still very much a theory, and some traumatologists and scientists, like, hate talking about mirror neurons because they're like, oh, mirror neurons get way too much publicity. Like, they're not that cool. And others will say, like, no, actually, mirror neurons are very important in the function and their role in empathy. So, is mirror neurons are still controversial, but basically Italian scientists accidentally discovered these specialized cells in the cortex of monkeys' brains, and that came to be known as mirror neurons. And you can do a deep dive into mirror neurons if this is your jam. Uh, I personally think it's really interesting because I love neurons. (laughs) I love science. But Just know that they're thought to be linked to empathy and how we respond when we witness something traumatic. So, and this isn't only when we witness something traumatic, but they light up on brain imaging studies in trauma studies. They also light up in positive situations, like someone smiling, someone having a really good piece of cake. You're all like, hmm. So it's not only negative, but they basically mirror you're observing something, an emotion, and your mirror neurons can mirror what you're observing. That's the main point. So here's an example from the Vet Confessionals Instagram page. And here, this was a comment response to the I was badly bitten uh, post that I had put up. And this is from Fork Love Spoons Creations. It says, doctor was being mauled in the room and I was at the far end of the microscope, far end of the hospital on the microscope, dot, dot, dot. Still get shakes if there is a loud noise and I'm at the scope. This is what I thought was really interesting. So that's why I took a picture of it because I was like, wow, I wonder if this is a form of secondary trauma. Again, I'm not diagnosing. This is just purely my opinion. I am not a mental health professional. I am just a veterinary doctor and educator in fields of this topic. But it says... The key points here are that when they go to the scope, that's the location of where the event occurred. And it didn't occur directly to them. So that's likely secondary trauma. It happened to a close colleague. And when they go back to the site of where they realized when they heard those noises, Um, If they hear a loud noise, all of a sudden their nervous system gets like they get the shakes because they're just catapulted back into that day, that moment. 
it's just triggered. So I thought that was really interesting example of how that could be secondary trauma. Because in our profession, we do see horrible things on a regular basis. And we are in this profession because we love animals or we love science, but we want to help animals. That's the end game. End point is like help them get better, help them not suffer. And of course, we want to help people too who are attached to these animals. That's definitely a part of it as well. This was a cat that was badly burned in a house fire and... Yeah, it just looks so sad. And we have to deal with this on a regular basis. And it's heartbreaking. I used to have a friend when I was working in Hawaii that would say, like, don't even talk to me about these cases. Don't even, like, invite me to come to the back area where all the animals are in cages. I just can't handle it. Like, my heart. Like, she was definitely, like, very sensitive. And you do kind of have to have a little bit of a tough skin to work with animals when you love them so much and want to help them so much. And like I said, it's not just the animals, it's also the people that we have to witness their pain and their sorrow and the difficulty they have with dealing with all sorts of different medical issues and saying goodbye and, oh, it's just so tough sometimes. Especially when it comes to children, it can be so hard. I don't know why, like, I don't even have kids, but the kids, I don't know if I just, it reminds me of my own childhood losses of like when I was a kid and had to lose pets that I really loved or just the fact that like you wish you could explain to them more, but their brains are not like depending on their age, it's not, it's just difficult to explain. They're just going through this grief and sadness and you just want to make it better for them when their animals are sick or they have to say goodbye. But then there are success stories. So again, I don't want to make it sound like it's all horrible and bad. And I want to insert the Lion King song here. But basically, <laughs> this is the cat from the house fire looking so much better. I mean, his ears are burnt off, but it's okay. Like he don't, he don't need those. He's fine. He's chilling. Look at him. He's all healthy. And this is why we do what we do because we want to see them better. We want to see success and it's just ultimately so joyful to like get them better. And it's so cool when you nail a diagnosis or you figure out what's going on and you cure them and it's just amazing. So just remember that. But we also need to know that trauma really does produce actual physiological changes, including recalibration of the brain's alarm system, an increase in stress hormone activity, and alterations in the system that filters relevant information from irrelevant. Trauma also compromises the brain area that communicates the physical embodied feeling of being alive. So if you notice you disassociate a lot or you're just like, wait, I don't even know what happened yesterday or the day before. or You know, that could be, I'm not saying that that could just be because you're busy, but it could also be a sign of kind of not really being embodied or being in the present moment. And then behaviors that are a result of trauma are not the result of moral failings, lack of willpower, or bad character. They are caused by actual changes in the brain, which I think is like so fascinating. So I'm going to get into that more. So some symptoms of trauma I want to point out, I'm going to go through each one of these boxes separately, but the most important point to understand from the symptoms of trauma is that not everybody reacts the same exact way. What you can do is just figure out how you 
react. And then maybe it also will give you information to help better understand how when clients are under traumatic stress, how they might react or when colleagues are under traumatic stress, how they might react. Like, but ultimately, you know, you the best. And that's why I think it's important to figure it out. So we're going to go ahead and get started on these boxes and we'll start with the brain alarm system. So the first one I'm going to talk about is this one, the faulty brain alarm systems. So what is the brain alarm system? Basically, the amygdala is like the smoke detector in our brain. It's the part of our brain outlined here in this picture that and there's an amygdala basically on in each hemisphere so just think of these pictures like there's a right side and a left side even though this image is kind of showing uh just one side of the brain but it's basically the limbic system and it identifies input relevant for survival the amygdala has served us very well in generations of survival. What it does is it detects danger, sends a message to the hypothalamus, which is over here, and the brainstem to recruit stress hormones and the autonomic nervous system to activate, activate flight or fight. Also, now they're calling flight, fight, freeze, or fawn, especially in the trauma world. Those are the additional activated stress reactions, which I'll get more into later. And then it identifies danger prior to conscious awareness of danger by the frontal lobe. So you might already be on the move before you even realize that you're running or you're fighting or you're punching someone in the face, you know? Um, that's just how quick your amygdala is. And trauma increases the risk of misinterpreting whether a particular situation is dangerous or safe. So that's how it can make brain's alarm system faulty. This picture is drawing is by Lucia Skye, and it is from Bessel van der Kolk's book, the trauma, the body keeps the score, and it shows how the brain here uh, sends signals to other parts of the body. So like the facial muscles communicating need for defense and protection, uh, the thyroid, the heart, the larynx, increased oxygen for fight or flight, to the GI tract for slowing down viscera, to adrenal glands for releasing stress hormone. And it says that trauma affects the entire human organism, body, mind, and brain. In PTSD, body continues to defend against a threat that belongs in the past. Healing from PTSD means being able to terminate this continued stress mobilization and restore the entire organism to safety. Uh, earlier this week, me and my friends were talking about how we sometimes feel like people are just going through the world, even ourselves sometimes, just in a constant state of activation of this PTSD, because the smallest thing can trigger this activation. And it's just really interesting, like, when you think of, like, if you're moving through the world in constant defense mode... It can be very exhausting and very difficult and just super energy draining. So I thought it was interesting. So coming back to what I said, the stress reaction, it's a reaction. It's not a response. And it occurs in less than 1 20th of a second when picked up by the amygdala as potential danger. So a response takes at least a couple minutes because that's how long it takes for information to be transferred from our sensory perceptions and subconscious to conscious thought. And these are the three common ones, fight or flight, everyone knows, then freeze. And now they've also added fawn, which is kind of falls in the category of people pleasing. And it's another type of stress, stress reaction, which I'll get more into those in another lecture. Uh, the next video I'll be doing, get more in detail. But this is just what you need to know for simplicity's sake for now. 
Another situation that occurs, which I'm just going to quickly go back to my first slide, is speechless horror. So we covered faulty brain alarm systems. Now we're talking about speechless horror and kind of the shifting to the one brain. So sometimes these kind of intertwined, it's not as clear cut like these boxes that I'd like it to be. They all kind of relate to each other, but trying to make it as simplified as possible to make it make sense. So this is a really interesting picture from Bessel van der Kolk's book as well that I thought was like so fascinating because what they did was 13 years after a traumatic event, brain imaging studies from re-traumatizing a patient to relive this event showed that the biggest area active of activation was in the right limbic area right here. And that's where the amygdala is in this situation. And then show decreased activity. In this case, the color indicated a decrease of activity instead of an increase in the left frontal lobe of the cortex in a region called the Broca's area. So this is the third picture here, what we're looking at, Broca's area, which is one of the speech centers of the brain. And stroke victims will lose ability to speak if blood supply is cut off to the Broca's area. Which is so crazy to think that like this, there isn't a blood supply cutoff situation happening here. There's a traumatic event that's causing that area to shut down. Almost as if there is a blood supply block off. Just so crazy. It's so cool that they can see this now. I just love brain imaging studies. I can't believe like technology has gotten this far. And already it's probably still considered pre like primitive too on some levels. But the Broadman's area 19 is activated in the visual cortex as well, which is where images are registered. So that's the second picture here. The visual cortex. So this is why sometimes there's speechless horror because that part of your brain literally shuts down. So sometimes if you're like, say something, hello, hello, you know, like people are just speechless. Um, that can be a result of a like during a traumatic event is what I'm talking about. Or when they're re-triggered to relive that event they can become speechless. And then this is why some images can also come back as flashbacks. And images can be registered in the visual cortex, even though speech is cut off. So under extreme conditions, people can also scream obscenities, call for their mothers, howl in terror, or just simply shut down. And when words fail, haunting images capture the experience and return as nightmares and flashbacks. Other unprocessed sense fragments of trauma like sounds and smells and physical sensations often can trigger a flashback as well. I remember I was like doing this training with the South Metro Fire Department in Denver and one of the firefighter guys was talking about how he was in a fatal house fire and it wasn't until he was specifically diving into trauma. Like he went into the fire department when he was like 17 and by 18, he had experienced 18 or 19 years of age. He'd already experienced his first fatal house fire call. And apparently in firefighting, when the ground is about to fall through like in a house when the integrity of the floor is lost it becomes kind of spongy apparently and every he said that he realized that like every time he was in his kitchen and would like step on the foam mat you know like the foam mat that makes it so like your knees don't get tired they're like anti anti-fatigue mats or whatever that people have in their kitchens, he would be re-triggered 
And he never realized why when that's when fights would break out with his partner in the kitchen or like that's when he would just become like all of a sudden very like just uncomfortable and he finally made that connection and i just thought it was so amazing when he shared that because he was like i didn't realize that every time i stepped on that faux mat it took me back to that place back to that fatal house fire back to the trauma of losing those people in the fire and not being able to help them and so like firefighters first responders like trauma and traumatic stress is like hugely well known in their profession so actually the fire department was so cool that they were doing all this additional their well-being department is like insanely good like they have so much so much resources for their firefighters it's really cool so they had invited me to come and join them for a week in their training to see what they do and hopefully share that which I will share at some point. It's just, it's a whole program that they do. So that's a whole nother series. But that was a very interesting thing that he shared. And sometimes it's just like, until you're diving deeper into these topics, you just don't know. And then the next box was shifting to one side of the brain, which kind of we talked about with the brain imaging study example I just showed you, but Trauma basically has been shown to also during flashbacks activate the right hemisphere of the brain and deactivate the left. Right brain, if you remember from, I don't know, what is it, like middle school biology or high school biology, I don't know when they teach that nowadays, but is the visual, spatial, tactical, and artistic side. And then uh, it's the first side to develop in the womb and carries the nonverbal communication between parents and infants. It stores memories of sound, touch, and smell. And then our left hemisphere is our rational, logical, linguistic, sequential, and analytical side. It remembers facts, statistics, vocab of events. If you don't remember brain anatomy, just Google it. There's left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and the corpus callosum connects the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. That's basic brain anatomy. So what does this all mean in trauma? Well, deactivation of the left hemisphere has a direct impact on the capacity to organize experience into a logical sequence. So Braca's area, which blacks out during trauma, is on the left side, which is like the picture that I showed you, which can explain a lot. And why it can feel like you are losing your mind sometimes. Because when someone, some, something reminds traumatized people of the past, their right brain reacts as if the traumatic event were happening in the present. But because the left brain isn't working very well, they might not be aware they are re-experiencing or reenacting the past. They're furious, they're terrified, they're enraged, they're ashamed, they're frozen. Any one of these doesn't have to be all of the above. So there is an actual loss of executive function here. After the emotional storm passes, they may look for something or somebody to blame for it because they just can't, like, they can't understand what happened. All they know is they were in this like, ah, oh, like life-threatening feeling. And this is one of the reasons why talk therapy doesn't always help resolve trauma. And this is why a lot of the expert traumatologists say that a multimodal approach is best. So if you can't afford a talk therapist, doesn't mean you can't heal from trauma. There's so many options, which I'm going to get into later. But that book, The Body Keeps the Score, also like the whole second half of that book is about that. So controlling the stress response becomes more difficult the more unresolved trauma you have. If the amygdala is the smoke detector of the brain, 
Think of the frontal lobes and specifically the medial prefrontal cortex, which is located directly above our eyes as the watchtower. It's called MPFC for short. And in PTSD or SDSD, the critical balance between the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex shifts radically, which makes it harder to control emotions and impulses. That's why it's not a lack of willpower necessarily. It's actually because you're triggered into your immediate reactive state of fight or flight or freeze or fawn. Sometimes you'll be like, why did I say that? Like, why were you immediately like people pleasing, for instance, when in your mind and body and soul, you just want to be like, no, I'm not going to stay late. But you're like, yeah, sure. And then you're just like, wait, that's just one small, tiny example. But Effectively dealing with stress depends on restoring this balance. And it can take years, guys, years. And if you get re-traumatized again, you could be back at square one. Honestly, nobody knows how long it takes or what the exact method is, but we're on this journey. We're trying to figure it out. And, you know, that's the best we can do right now. So coming back to the symptoms of trauma chart with the, my little boxes, we've covered the first four or five, and now we're about here in the middle of the boxes, and we just talked about inability to control stress responses. So what can also happen is sensory overload. So in normal circumstances, the thalamus, which is a structure in your brain, again, you can look up brain anatomy if you don't know, also acts as a filter or gatekeeper. And this makes it a central component of attention, concentration, and new learning, all of which are compromised by trauma. So it normally helps to distinguish between sensory information that is relevant and information that you can safely ignore. People with PTSD or SDSD have their floodgates wide open, lacking a filter, they are con on constant sensory overload. This is, and in order to cope, they try and shut themselves down, they might develop hyper-focus and tunnel vision, Often they might turn to drugs or alcohol to try and numb out or block out the world because it can all feel very overwhelming. The tragedy is that the price of shutting down includes filtering out sources of pleasure and joy as well. Unfortunately, we can't just selectively shut down. Maybe one day someone will figure out a way to do that, but just right now it doesn't exist. And so... The important thing to realize here is like there are actually healthy ways to help you cope with sensory overload. And sometimes I honestly wonder if like being introverted is one of them. If it comes from like, oh my gosh, like going out and being extroverted can sometimes feel so overstimulating that, you know, you might need to come back and recoup. But one thing that I really like is using like sound canceling headphones or noise canceling headphones when I'm knowing that like, for instance, with traveling, because that's a high, like a kind of hyper vigilant feeling when you're traveling, because, you know, we've all read the stories of terrorist attacks and stuff and like, like things can go wrong when you're out of your safety, you're out of your element. So trying to like think about even things as simple as that can really help you. Um, you may never 100% fix your trauma or like be fully healed. I put in quotation marks, quote unquote, because I don't even know what that means. Um, but if you had options and if you had ways of like managing something and making life more enjoyable because you have these options, like, wouldn't you take it? I mean, maybe you wouldn't, but it's just for me, helped me so much. The loss of self can be another trauma response. So this is another box in the boxes of trauma responses. So numbing, feeling dead inside, especially in situations that warrant emotion. I always try and be really careful, like, because as veterinary professionals, we can be um, very, 
how do I say this, callous to death. Um, it's important that like when someone is going through grief or having a moment to express actually like, oh, they're not callous. They're not like dead inside. Like we are. No, I'm kidding, but kind of not. So kind of it can be difficult to show the appropriate emotion and people might be like, what the heck is wrong with this person? It's like, oh, I'm in the vet field, you know, that, they're not going to get it. If you're in the vet field, you get it. <laughs> if you're not in the vet field, it's tough. You may seem very cold and that's not the way you want to come across, but it can come across that way. Otherwise, outward manifestations of blank stares and absent minds can indicate difficulty living in the present. Like I've noticed it in my uh, colleagues sometimes when I'm working with them, I'm like, hello, is anyone there? <laughs> you know, like, or we're in a room together and the person I'm working with, the nurse or assistant is just kind of like zoned out staring off into the distance sure that might just be zoning out and that might not be trauma but just think about it if you're having a difficult time staying in the present that could be a manifestation of trauma and just overall feeling dis disembodied like <laughs> disembodied sometimes when i'm doing yoga and like teachers would in the beginning of the class will be like, so where in your body do you feel like you need uh, love right now? Or like you need focus on right now. And in the beginning, I'll always be like, oh, I feel fine. Not always, but like sometimes when I'm kind of probably disembodied, again, quote unquote, air quotes, um, I might be like, oh, no, everything feels great. And then I'll suddenly be moving and I'll be embodied because that's what yoga practice can do. I'm like, oh, actually, like my upper back and oh, my hip. And, and I'm just, that's why I love doing yoga because it gets me in my body and connected back to my body. Because sometimes for survival, you just need to disconnect. And that's okay too. I don't want people listening to this feeling like, oh my God, I can't do any of this stuff. Or it's like, no, these stuff exist for survival as coping mechanisms. And it's not wrong to like utilize them when you need to. But it is important to acknowledge when it's being utilized in a way that's detrimental to your well-being and when it's being used in a way that's conducive to your well-being. Disassociation and reliving is another symptom of trauma. That, and disassociation actually can be the essence of trauma because the overwhelming experience is split off and fragmented so that emotions, sound, images, thoughts, and physical sensations related to the trauma take a life of their own. And the sensory fragments of memory intrude into the present where they are literally relived. As long as the trauma is not resolved, the stress hormones that the body secretes to protect itself keep circulating and the defensive movements and emotional response keep getting replayed. One may have no idea why they respond to some minor irritation as if they were about to be annihilated. <laughs> uh, like seriously guys, even sound sometimes, you know how some people really um, can get triggered by noise. Well, sometimes that's related to trauma. Just a thought, just throwing it out there. And like the anger, for instance, of like the bass noise, like coming from outside or someone's car or like some neighbor might feel like you are being annihilated. But Really, there is a term called me misophonia, which is a mental health term where it's the dislike of certain sounds because it actually feels like very threatening. And there's different theories around this. But anyway, just one way of maybe that people can relate to. I worked with a lot of people in the vet profession who can't even handle the noise of people chewing <laughs> and eating their food on the Zoom calls, they'd be like, can we not? Uh, but if animals do it, it's fine.
you know, somehow there's a difference. I don't know. But yeah, just a minor example. And ultimately, trauma can lead to the loss of feeling safe. Being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. Sure, you can go be a hermit out on a mountain and never talk to anyone and be perfectly content. There is nothing wrong with that if that's truly your personality and what you enjoy and what you want to be doing. But ultimately, social support is the most powerful protection against becoming overwhelmed by stress and trauma. And we as a human species thrive on connection and helping each other and being there for each other and being in community. You can be alone if that's what you want to do. Just make sure like you've assessed, is it a trauma response that I'm fleeing or... Is this truly what I want? Because ultimately, we can go farther and do better and be better together. And trauma can make the world seem like we're amongst a bunch of aliens. And in the past two decades, research has shown that when people become too skittish or shut down to derive comfort from other humans, relationships with other mammals can help. And this made me think of like, okay, so imagine like some people how attached they are to their pets and we as veterinary professionals deal with these people and how we could even inadvertently be re-triggering these people because they don't trust humans anymore. And their sole connection is with their pets. And so when they're losing that, they can be spiraling out of control. And it's hard to keep that in mind when you're in the emergency room and you're on your 10th um, day or 10th hour in the day, 10th day in the week, 10th, you know, you're just like, oh, I'm also like kind of running, running low on reserves here and you're dealing with these situations. It's hard to remember, but important to try and keep somewhere in the back of your mind because it may help you better understand what people are going through. And the critical, critical issue is reciprocity. Acts of kindness can really go a really long way. And most people minimize the value in that, but it is significantly important because it shows community. It shows community support. And lastly, there is the reorganization of perception that from if you do get the book, like page 15, there is a great passage of the reorganization of perception. It's right after the inkblot test, but um, I will try and include it here. Maybe I'll include it as like a short little video. Uh, but basically, it emphasizes that trauma changes people's perceptions and imagination. I will go through the inkblot test, though, and just can you can see by if you are watching this, um, how it can provide a unique way to observe how people construct a mental image from what's basically a meaningless stimulus, such as a blot of ink. And traumatized people have a tendency to superimpose their trauma on things around them. So that's really important to note, though, because like how you perceive something might be very different than someone next to you. So this is the first inkblot test. Um, and I'll just give you a second to kind of look at it and write down maybe what you're seeing. Just the first thing that comes to your mind is just the right answer. Don't overthink it. But when I look at this one, for instance, I see like two chihuahuas, probably because I'm in vet med. Um, and this is like, I'll just outline with my mouse cursor here, like the ears of the head and the body and the legs of the chihuahuas. And then this is another chihuahua here. But some people say also, it looks like dancing, or whirling dervishes because this is like the hand here 
the heads and they're like dancing and there could be many other things that people see like batman or bat signal who knows this is the second image in the inkblot roshark test it's the first one with color and in the book the body keeps the score they talk about how when um traumatized war veterans would see this they would immediately superimpose like their experiences with their battle and losing friends and seeing blood and gore and explosions and such which is really interesting because a normal non-war traumatized person might look at it and see like two heads here of like again like two monks or something like putting their hands up to each other or like dancing when i first saw this and i still can't unsee it are like i see like two dogs lying next to each other like this is the head of a dog this is the ears and honestly guys the other day i was like taking a shower and i was just like seeing dogs everywhere i think i was on like my 10th shift in a row or something I just was like very very tired and my shower tiles like have all these weird like blotches on them and I swear like everywhere I looked I was like dog 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 ah I'm like I just was like oh my gosh I need to get some rest like I don't want to be looking in my shower and just seeing like I was so exhausted just seeing dogs everywhere because uh, that's the primary species I deal with but in this one, I do see dog like laying on a stretcher or laying on the ground with like blood coming out of their head, arm, nose, like a hit by car trauma, especially because I deal with emergency medicine primarily and see a lot of hit by cars. And this is the third and final image. <laughs> Again, just first thing that comes to your mind. I think some people, when I present this at conferences, would be like, oh, penguins, like the emperor penguins and, you know, see cute stuff. But they also say that if it looks like a menacing figure, like bearing down on you, you may have an issue with authority <laughs> like i was just like what because that is definitely what i saw. doesn't again this is none of this is to like diagnose any sort of condition it's just and in the united states the ink blot test is more controversial than in other countries that seem to rely on it more and use it more in the mental health field. But the point of this exercise is really just to be like, see how like a meaningless blot of ink, your brain is already trying to conjure up like meaning, like put meaning onto this and what kind of meaning you might impose onto it just could give you a little bit of insight. That's all. You don't have to go rush to like your doctor and be like, oh my gosh, I messed up. No. Or, you know, tell yourself like, oh, I'm just fine because I saw all good stuff. I mean, it's just a fun little thing to try and keep things interesting, try and keep things creative and just educate and talk about like what's going on. What are people doing? What are people looking at? And the good news is that the increase of research and knowledge around trauma has also opened up new possibilities to palliate or even reverse the damage. So now we can develop methods and experiences that utilize the brain's own natural neuroplasticity to help survivors feel fully alive in the present moment and move on with their lives. It is a pretty good feeling like when you do actually start to respond differently to a previous situation situation that would have had you spiraling in the past like that conquering that can feel so good and that's my hope with like this education lecture is to tell you that like neuroplasticity is real really exists like neuroplasticity which i will get into is basically this is the end of the first part of this lecture, but there is a really good video on YouTube which explains what neuroplasticity is, and I will put the link below, but it's the brain's ability to rewire itself.
So I just got done talking about all the ways like your brain goes haywire, but there are ways to like bring things back into equilibrium. So on that note, thank you for listening. And this is the end of the first part of this lecture and stay tuned for the next part. And also feel free to stay in touch. You can email me. You can go on to DBM 360 website. You can go on to Instagram, Facebook, the Vet Confessionals Project, all these different ways to get in touch. And we'll leave it on a good note because just know that like the research and knowledge around trauma has opened up new possibilities to palliate or even reverse damage. And we can now develop methods and experiences that utilize the natural neuroplasticity of the brain to help survivors feel fully alive in the present moment. And I hope that you found this lecture informative. If I missed anything or misquoted anything, please feel free to let me know either down in the comments or email me whichever way you feel comfortable. Again, this is just like a combination of all my research that I just want to share with everyone, not just at conferences, but now on my YouTube channel as well, just to make sure that if someone is looking for more information regarding to the vet profession, that it's available and it's out there. So thanks for listening. And I hope you have a good rest of your day or continue listening to more videos or whatever you're doing. I hope that it goes well. Thanks. Bye.